We have Jerry Henry here with his production company, Cactus Eyelash. Yep. Uh, oh yeah, Sam's here too. My channel name is Potato Jet and people are always like, what the hell? Same. Cactus Eyelash is probably right there with it, right? Yeah, it's Cactus Eyelash. I was, cause in high school I was a battle rapper and uh, I used to like just slay fools. And like one of the lines I think I said, it was like, I'm brash like a cactus eyelash or something like that. And it just stuck. So you're primarily a cinematographer for documentaries. I mean, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a doc DP, which took me a long time to come to terms with that because a lot of times people think that you know, because you shoot documentary, there's, you know, there's no cinematographer, no director of photography, but I mean, you know, I'll challenge anyone to do what I do. Oh yeah, no, it's it's an art for sure, yeah. 100%. Just being able to like disappear, uh, shoot verite, which is one of the hardest st styles of shooting. I mean, obviously shooting interviews that are set up and, yeah. and looking nice and appropriate for the scene, that's part of it, but really like capturing those real moments, those are always mind blowing. So yeah. How did you know that was gonna happen at that point where you had the yeah. perfect framing and yeah. focus and then, you know, a lot of these yeah. things are unexpected, right? Yeah. But then when you have it, when you get it, you're just like, oh, I, I got it, I got it. Yeah, it's, you know it's you still got focused. it. Yeah. Okay, good, 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 yeah. oh, I got it. It's a craft and I don't know, I just, I just really love how when you're in the moment, you're capturing just real life happening in front of you and it's just, it's, it's dope. Did you enjoy shooting for Vice? I did, yeah. I shot for Vice for probably about four years. Uh -huh. um, traveled all over and yeah i mean just made stuff you know what would what, what surprise me is like some stuff that i would shoot and you'd be like and eh, i don't know if this is working eh. and then the editors would get in there and just do their magic and make you look like a superstar oh no that's how i feel a lot of times when i'm even shooting these youtube videos yeah. i'll shoot and then walk away and i'll be like i don't know if we've got anything yeah. and we just spend hours and hours in editing and be like oh wait we can kind of form yeah, yeah, yeah. it like that. We could really tell it. So sometimes re-watching the videos yeah. we shoot is more exciting than actually being yeah. there, you know? Yeah. I shot on a show called Black Market. We did this one episode on, I went to Cameroon and followed this, you know, illegal smuggling. So the most trafficked animal in the world. Have you ever heard of a pangolin? No, but I saw the Vice yeah. uh, documentary that you shot. We followed it from... Cameroon all the way to Hong Kong. You really have to be ready for that scene, right? Yeah, and, and you, you have to have a life insurance policy too, because a lot of that shit is dangerous. Yeah, were there any close calls on oh, your end? Well, tons of times. Okay, so I remember we were in the jungle, we were shooting the traffickers, and then we were following the rangers in the jungle. So the night before, we were with the traffickers, following them, and they're looking for this pangolin. Going through the jungle, it's at nighttime, it's nothing but flashlights. And one of them decided that he was going to take a nap, fall asleep on the side of the road, but he left his motorbike out. So then the next day, we went to the rangers, but didn't tell the rangers that we had been filming the traffickers the night before. So then they find this truck and everyone's asleep and, and they just basically find the motorcycle and then just walk in and just arrest everybody. So those dudes were just like, man, y'all sold us out. And that next day, it got pretty hairy because they thought we sold them out. So I was at the hotel. They knew where we lived. Oh no. So after they got let out, those the traffickers just rolled up to the hotel and was like, what's up? Dude, my, hair, <laughs> my hairs are standing up just hearing yeah. that story. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> you kind of have to go out there and be like, we just happened to be with them. We did not tell them where you were. No, I just was like, hey, go talk to the producer. I'll just shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and he went to the producer. He's in room 318. And then he just went over. They went over there and just. And, and now he's they missing. They worked some out. Well, nah, I think, I think they, you know, they, they, you know. That's one of the things that's always tripped me out about Vice documentaries yeah. is that you actually go in and interview yeah. the other side. Yeah, and every the about. thing about this show is that everyone, their identity was masked, but we could never blur their face out because it just looks kind of crappy when you blur somebody's face out. So we always had to come up with a creative way to shoot them so that you couldn't see their face. So we would put like, you know, people would be in silhouettes so they would wear handkerchiefs or something. Man, how do you get trust from people like that? A lot of times, you know, we work with a fixer and that's the person that's on the inside. They have some sort of connection with the person that we're trying to film and then they just because they live there, they work it out. I'm sure money has some yeah. strength to it, but they do. They just 
figure out a way to, that we can go in and film with them. But it's always someone who's local who has some sort of connection to the group that we're trying to to, to shoot. Ooh. And it's and it you know it does get hairy. Like there was one episode we were filming the the yakuza. Oh yeah. And um, I mean it's everything you think it would be. You know just blood and guts and fighting and nonsense. Oh man, yeah. that's that's that'd be nuts. Would yeah. you would you still shoot another documentary for Vice if they asked you? No. You, you're 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 a family man now. Yeah, I mean, I've been a family man, but my my son's getting older and my daughter's getting older. I just you know, I just want to make it to graduation. I'm sort of in my career where I'm like, I don't really need to do that stuff anymore. Right, you've yeah. got plenty of opportunities yeah. here. We were shooting in South Central, and you know, I had back in the day they had those big ENG cameras you put on your shoulder, and it was like two in the afternoon. I was like shooting some B-roll. The producers were in the truck. Because we were in South Central, and they were like, hey, man, go shoot some B-roll. And I was like, all right. And I just went out. And I'm shooting. And then I look around, and I'm the only one standing out there. And I'm like, where the hell did everybody go? And so this door opens, and these two homies come out, and they're like, hey, man, what are you doing? I'm like, ah, man, just, you know, I'm outside. I'm shooting some B-roll. And they're like, hey, man, so uh, what time is it? You know what time it is? And I'm like, oh, uh, it's, and they're like, nah, man. Give it up, give it up. So I took the camera off the tripod, gave him the tripod, gave him the camera, and they just walked away with it. In the meantime, the producers are in the van just looking at me. Didn't come out to help. They didn't come out to help or anything? Oh, man. About two minutes later, as I'm just like standing there, they come out and they're like, hey, man, how do you work this? (laughs) No way. (laughs) So then I gave them a tutorial. I'm like, hey, man, you just (laughs) put this on your shoulder. You just focus. And then they just walked back away with the camera. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) Then after that, I was just like, okay, this is my last day. Do you ever get nervous interviewing people that definitely don't want their identity known? No, not really, because, you know, it depends. Oh, okay, so I worked on this documentary uh, called Exit Through the Gift Shop. You know who Banksy is then? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically for that film, that was a different era. I mean, you think about 2005, 2006. Oh, yeah. No one had cell phones and cameras. So we would do cr- just go out in broad daylight and do stuff. Happen in two minutes and we'd be gone. And by the time someone found out of it, it'd be two weeks later. Right. You can't do that now. Right. It's a different time. And so I think I'd be probably be more worried now. Not necessarily for me, but other people sort of just always with the phones. Just In the scene where Mr. Brainwash gets gets caught in Disneyland, how did you guys even oh. sneak in cameras like that? In baby carriages. Oh. oh. What? Oh. They ain't gonna wake the baby up. Yeah, man. Yeah. They ain't gonna wake the baby. So you just put a bunch of cameras in there? Yeah, and you just kind of carry them in. Don't wake the baby up. Don't wake the baby up. Yeah, that whole situation there got hairy, right? Oh, absolutely. But I don't know if people realize this. Brainwash was always around. So the film didn't start out about him. So that was just the last six or seven, eight months of us shooting. We even been shooting for a long time. It's just... Once they realized that there was a story, they were like, hey, just follow that and see where that's going. And just how it happens in the documentary, they're trying to get that footage from them. Right. They just realized that there's all this interesting stuff happening with him. Whatever it was, he breaks his leg and he's, you know, he's just like a sort of kind of caricature of himself. Generally speaking, when you guys start shooting a documentary, how often do you know what the documentary is going to be about when you start shooting? So now I would say probably 90% of the time. Back then... 20% 20% of the time. Now with Netflix, there's a big budgets behind it. Yeah, and there's a lot of people to... responsible. So there's an outline. There's, you know, and that's the thing about documentaries. Like, you have to literally write out the film before you shoot it. When it's that amount of money that's involved, obviously, you know, you're, you're responsible. And, you know, all these other people are responsible. That you're right. going to actually turn in something that you're going to say. So that you, you're going to do. Yeah, so you can't really take as much of a risk. When no, you have a bigger budget, like no uh, your, the Netflix series there's no that you're risk. shooting. Yeah. No, there's no risk. I mean, it's just too much money involved. Right, yeah. You want to make sure that you're going to deliver it. That's what a, a showrunner does. Is they're basically, they're going to hand over the finished product and make sure that it goes out. Pre-production is where you actually make the film. Right. You know, production is you've already have figured out what you're going to do. You're not trying to figure that out as you're doing it. You leave moments where you can have things happen organically, but you 
you have to have a story or you're not, you know, you have no point of view. Mm -hmm. So if I'm making a film, I know who my characters are. I know their story. I'm actually directing a film in Mumbai right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so same. It's like you have a story with your characters and who your characters are. You follow that, but then you just leave the room for, uh, you know, magic to happen. But I do know my story before I go in. You have to, or you'll be shooting that thing forever. But then on the other hand, a uh, documentary like Exit Through the Gift Shop, you it, it was uh, it was a little bit more independent. It was kind of like you Completely artists getting together to I, shoot I, something. I, yeah. So, that way, you just started filming, and then you realized, oh, look yeah. at what we have. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, Banksy was doing things, and he's always been doing things, mm -hmm. right? You know, street art. So that was documented. Mm -hmm. But the story just started to come out when we realized that, you know, uh, Terry was the central figure. It's yeah. got almost a coin flip. You're kind of like, uh, this could yeah. turn into something great. Yeah. But it might also just be a huge waste of time. Yeah. I mean, and a waste of time in a sense that, like, you don't follow something long enough where you're, you know, you have the opportunity to see what's going to happen. I mean, we just, you know, financially, sometimes uh -huh. you don't have that luxury. Right. You know, it, maybe if it's a story that's local, like your neighbor or something, sure, you have access to them because you right. can just go next door. But if you're shooting in another state, another part of the city or you know, wherever, you, sometimes you don't have that luxury. And... Yeah, so you definitely have to know what you're doing before you go in. When you were shooting Exit Through the Gift Shop, I imagine at first, at least, you had no idea it was going to go anywhere. You were just kind of like, eh, I'm just shooting this. Nah, I mean, and it was a bunch of us shooting. It wasn't just me. It was like multiple people. So whenever you were available, they would just, people would just shoot. Right. You know? um, so yeah, I mean, you're like, oh yeah, this is cool. You know? I imagine you would have never have imagined it to turn into what it was. No, not at all. And it wasn't until I saw it, I just had the biggest laugh ever, because then the, Everything started to make sense. I was like, oh my God, that's why. Oh, 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 yeah. So, even you, as someone that was shooting part of it, you didn't really know what it was going to mold into. You didn't know. No. The and, the, you know, the thing that sucks is so Brainwash, gave, he would give me all these prints all the time. I'm like, man, this is garbage, man. And I would just tear it up. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, I grab one and I just kind of whatever and just put it and it get all crumpled and I'm like, ah, whatever. <sighs> Jesus. Oh, man. Yeah. So when you started, when you started Exit Through Shot, was that still early on in your career or was you already? Uh, I, I, so I officially, I said I started shooting in 99 okay. and this was about 2005. So I had, I was doing a lot of MTV stuff, like shooter, producer kind of stuff following. There was a show that was called True Life yeah. and Made. You know, I worked on that show. And it was just like single camera, run and gun. Just, you know, you run into a room, there's 10 people. You got to cover everybody and do sound and do releases and can get water, everything. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, that's, I, basically, that's how I learned how to shoot. Because if I ran into a room or followed someone, I had a point of view. Like I could figure out, okay, so what's the story? What am I trying to capture? Because sometimes the thing in front of you, that's not the most important thing, it's the, it's the reaction. Right. So I knew that I could always go back and get maybe somebody entering a room, because it was all single camera, but the reaction, you had to get it when it happened. So then I would like get the reaction, then swing over, and then you'd see the action. Right. Not the other way around. So sometimes it just made me sort of, you know, figure out, okay, what is the point of view? What am I trying to tell? What's the story that I'm trying to tell? And I think that's, you know, probably one of the biggest things I learned from working on that kind of stuff. Right. I'm directing this film in Mumbai right now, which is, it's a, it's a documentary about these B-boys from the neighborhood uh, the Slumdog Millionaire takes place. It's the slums. Yeah. Uh, same with that. It's like the story's already changing, but I know who my character is. And I know so, kind of what the story is, but we're leaving ourselves the the freedom and sort of kind of luxury to kind of wait to see what happens. Right. So a lot of times they do the story does deviate a bit. You kind of have your absolutely idea it could completely <clears throat> take a U turn, which right. that's happened with this story. And so you just have to be ready for it. Kind of cool because writers write in s twists yeah. into films, but it's kind of just like real life twists that. Yeah, I mean, and that's what life is, right? You, you just lots of things happen unexpectedly, mm -hmm. so you just, you know, it's just beautiful to be able to capture it. You've also done some stuff in the music scene too. Huh? Yeah, um, yeah. So I worked on that series, The Defiant Ones. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible experience, just working with Dre and just being in the room when there's someone that that's prolific and just seeing how they 
as an artist come up with the stuff that they do. It's incredible. I mean, you just, you really realize why people are icons. Well, with your style, in most cases, yeah. do you kind of try to be a fly on the wall and just document instead so, of... So, like that project, uh, like a lot of other projects, because it took about four years to shoot. I was specifically brought in because of my verite, my shooting, being able to disappear in a room. And, you know, when they realized that you can't have a documentary with just talking heads, you can, but sometimes it's not that interesting. It's just better to just capture people in their real yeah. sort of everyday existence. And that's why I was brought in. I just literally just would just go hang out with Dre. Sometimes I'd shoot, just put the camera down, hang out, pick it back up, shoot a little bit more. He'd be like, hey man, capture this. And then I'm, I'll shoot it. Hey man, run it back, run it back. <laughs> and I'd shoot it, he's like, ah, oh, yeah, no, nah, I don't like that. Let's do it again. <laughs> and that was the other thing that was just like, blowing my mind like man i'm in the room with dre right now and he's uh -huh. just just a normal person i remember when we were hanging out one time you were telling me that when you were working with dre there was something that you saw very interesting about him and decided to shoot but he didn't he was kind of confused was like why are you shooting oh, this is boring yeah so steve jobs wore the same thing every day yeah he would wear like a black turtleneck and black pants because it was the one thing that you don't have to think about if you wear the same thing every day you can put all your energy into something else right dre did the same thing he just always wore all black so i'm like shooting him and he's like man what are you doing i'm like ah, man just you know that's interesting well, what's what's going on why is it man nobody wants to see that and that and so then i was like no what what's going on with that and he and so it wasn't on camera but off camera he told me this story that after you know the whole death throw thing happened or whatever he just decided to just wear the same thing and i just thought that was fascinating i mean it's and this yeah. you know there's a reason why people like him and sort of your steve jobs and you know that's the one less thing they have to think about and they put all their energy into what they're doing right yeah totally just get rid of any sort of mental distraction yeah. right and i remember we were at uh, Madison Square Garden and, and then WA was getting inducted into the Hall of Fame and it was crazy because we were in the room and there's all these people there producers and everyone and walking down this hallway and it's like Kendrick Lamar and Quest Love I mean name it everyone was what's congratulations Dre what's up Dre hey man Kanye hey Dre everyone's just and I'm just following them and then we go into this room and it's just me and him and then I'm getting ready to leave he's like nah man you good you can stay and I'm like, what's going on? He's like, man, I'm nervous, man. That was the moment I was like, man, dude, that's, you know, he bleeds like I bleed, breathes like I breathe. Yeah, he's a human. And what's cool about a lot of the stuff that you shoot is that you capture that realness. Yeah. You know, it's it's less polished Hollywood. Yeah. It's like, what's he really like in, as a person, you know? And you kind of get to yeah. see that and capture but that. But I mean, and the other thing, he's just, and I just realized he's the same person all the time. You know, right. And when you get to his age and you, you're in, a, in a, the industry that long, you, you know, he's at a place he can just, just exist and just do what he does. Right. And I thought that was cool, man. The shooting ratio of oh. something like that must be nuts. It's nuts. Like, you never know when something's going to happen. So when something happens, you better be rolling, right? Yeah. So do you just kind of roll all day? I mean, you can. And, and, you know, the thing that sucks about that is by the time stuff starts happening, you're tired. You know, I shoot with an easy rig. Yeah. Exclusively. Like I, the camera's here. So that way, if I'm shooting here, I can look that way and look that way. And I can kind of tell when stuff is my, you know, my, people might say I'm psychic, you know, sometimes you do, you're just rolling and nothing's happening or you roll on something. You're like, eh, somebody might have a conversation with someone. You're like, eh, whatever. That was insignificant. And then you're scrolling through the footage. You're like, oh my God, that's the moment when this happened. And then the whole story can kind of build from there. I mean, it's, that's what I think is the hardest part about documentary, but it's also the beauty of it. When I started working with you, I was really young and yeah. I didn't really yeah, understand you're still a lot. Young, man. I mean, yeah, I know, but I was like 18 <laughs> when we met. Yeah. You know? And I just always. So am I, I, man. <laughs> <laughs> when I started working with you, I, we worked in stuff like a little mini doc about a girl that's dropped out of college and started feeling, fitting the homeless. Yeah. To like documentaries about when Obama left office yeah, and yeah. We, we interviewed Will I Am. Yeah. So when, working with you for those three or four years, it really like just changed the way I see the world. How was it like for you when you made that transition into documentary? You know, I guess that's when I realized that like basically the power of it too. Like you realize that everyone has a story, right? Not just 
people that are famous or people who, but everyone has a story. And so I felt like I could treat every single person equally. It doesn't matter who you are, someone, everyone has something to say. You even have something to say. You have something to say, you know? And so um, just the variety of everything I work on, I know I just appreciate to have, you know, I mean, shit, man, how many films? I've probably done over 100 yeah. different docs and projects and stuff and every single one of them completely different do you often find yourself conducting the interviews or are you strictly uh, oh kind of yeah so i did this film with yg mm -hmm. his album stay dangerous was released last summer and so we had to make this short film about what stay dangerous means i did all the interviews but i screwed myself because the first interview I had the easy rig and we were just starting to shoot and I was shooting and it was all handheld. And then I realized, F I gotta shoot all the interviews like this. Cause they were like, oh man, we really like that handheld feel. It feels all gritty and organic. And I'm like, F so I'm like holding <laughs> papers and my phone and trying to shoot and focus. It was a, it was a nightmare, but oh, it looked man. great because it just had a different feel to it, you know? Yeah. Uh, but it was, yeah, I, I don't know if I'll ever do that again. Oh, the depth yeah. of field is shallow as hell, and then I'm trying to hold it, and then the easy rig. And right, you got to give him an eye and line. You just and, look and, like, and then yeah. you just look crazy, too. And he's just, yeah. why he's just looking at me like, hey, man, what? what? You got your shit together? <laughs> yeah, you just look like you don't know what you're doing. You would prefer to you just stay focused on the camera and then have someone conduct the interview. Yeah, yeah. but the, the beauty of it, though, was that the interviews just had an extra little thing to them. It's less intrusive on them so you get yeah. much more of that organic kind of Yeah, and there's less response. people in the room too cuz that that yeah. also helps too. There was there was I did my own sound too. So I just put up a boom. Oh man, yeah. To have the camera, there was a second camera that my the co-director, he was shooting as well and then he would ask questions, but then he'd be like if you ask a question just still talk to Jerry, you know. So then I'm here and he's asking him questions and and then the only other person was our AC and that was it. Right. I mean, it was yeah. just three people in the room. Yeah, I mean, mo more people in the room, the more formal I feel like the people in front of the camera have yeah. to feel like they need to be. Yeah. I mean, like, here we can feel relaxed because you're just uh, Yeah, I mean, it's just three people. And no one behind these cameras. Yeah. But if there's, like, six people behind there, we'll be like, so uh, Yeah. It'll be very... But then it's stressful as hell, too, because, like, then you're wearing sh Did I hit record? Yeah. Is it in focus? Yeah, I got to check. We are recording. Okay, good. I have to check to make sure that there's yeah. a red light there. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So it's the same. I mean, you know, it has its pluses and minuses. But for the this project, it just, it was, it was a style choice that I just had to keep. Do you have a go-to camera that you often shoot with or do you just kind of bounce between whatever the project is? Depends on the project. But I, I generally, most of the documentaries I shoot with is uh, FS7. Are you a big lens guy or? Uh, yeah. You, what, yeah, and everything's um, manual. Like I, 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 a lot of times I shoot with super speeds because I the depth of field. But I just like so I, I feel like a lot of these newer lenses are just too clinical. Like they don't have character. Yeah, they they're have, too. Crisp. They're just too crisp. Yeah. They don't have you know um, just that little thing that makes it you know because the thing is is these cameras are so high resolution anyways. Mm -hmm. What's funny is like sometimes people get these really expensive cameras and they'll put like a f cheap ass lens. Yeah. Like like that right there. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> now nah, I want to talk about you. You know, people always ask me, "Hey, man, what's the best camera to get?" And I'm like, "Man, the one you can afford. You get the camera and you invest in the glass." Right. Yeah. No, for sure. Because especially yeah. just with how good cameras are yeah. now. I mean, just. I mean, like, you can shoot. You know, I have some stuff oh shot on an iPhone that I'm like, you know, trip, tripping out about because I'm like, they, you know, obviously, and if it works for the piece. It'd be right. the right tool. I mean, right. all these are tools. Like, I don't get hung up with, I shoot with the Alexa, I shoot with this and that. I don't care about any of that. Right, yeah. I mean, every camera has a purpose, has a, it has a, it's a tool, and you just have to find the right tool for the job. This was what I started off yeah. with. This was, yeah. you know, a, a thousand bucks at yeah. the time or something like that. But you look at it and you go, that looks terrible. Yeah. But now, if you spend a thousand bucks on a camera, yeah. it's like, that. If you do yeah. it right, it looks pro. Absolutely. Those black magic pocket cameras? Come on, man. I mean, yeah. it's like 6K and what is it like? I actually have it over there. You want to see it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this camera, I think, is 2500 bucks for the body. Yeah. 
you have to accessorize it of yeah. course but i mean the sensor performance out of this thing yeah. you know really w when you start looking into the differences between this and much more expensive it's it's very specific yeah. you know it's it's a majority of people would be totally happy yeah. with something like this yeah. yeah no i mean that's incredible look how small it is have you uh thought about picking up one of these i mean you the one of these i yeah. mean I, I had an ursa but that thing was heavy as hell right yeah and so i couldn't re you can't really shoot with it because it was too heavy um, and then the Ursa, what was it, the Mini came out or whatever. And then the form factor was weird. But the DSLR, I mean, you know, you can hold this and, you know, you could potentially shoot something like this. Oh, yeah. If someone's like, oh, I want to shoot documentaries like you do one day. Like, is there any advice you can give to just people at home? That yeah, you know, it's interesting because now, you know, the equipment's getting better. It's getting cheaper. It's more accessible. But I, I would say if you do buy a camera... Just learn the hell out of it. Like right. that's the only thing that's gonna have you um, become an expert. You know, there's that. What is that thing? It's called the ten thousand hour rule. Yeah. Well, you like need, if you do something for ten thousand hours, you can consider yourself an expert. I mean, that takes about that time. That's about what five years if you did it full time. That's about how long it took me to do what I'm doing. Right. But if someone wants to jump into it, I, you gotta make your own films. And, and the reason why is because then people will start to recognize you for your voice and what you're trying to say. Yeah, and I think also with YouTube and other online platforms, it's yeah. easier than ever to just kind of yeah. get it seen, right? Yeah. So I remember just like, this is before cell phones, like knocking on doors and trying to tr find people and, hey, can you take a second to look into my reel and all this? But I think with, you know, like, Instagram and, you know, Vimeo and like those kind of platforms, you can actually just kind of direct people towards what you're doing. And if your stuff is good enough, it might become like the, the Vimeo pick of the week. But the one thing you do have to be, you just have to be ready for when it comes. You have to be ready for whatever the next thing is or right. the next, next thing is because people don't, you know, you've done that project and they always ask you, hey, man, what are you working on next? They, right. they, they seen that project and, oh, that's cool, but what are you working on next? Right. And you'd be like, oh, well, I'm not, uh... You know, you right. just have to, even if you bullshit too. Yeah, like Jerry was actually the one that taught me everything that I, well, he kind of, I was his AC for a while. Oh yeah, how was I, Sam as an AC? <laughs> oh, I sucked. I, <laughs> I sucked so much. He was yeah, so Yeah, there was a lot of me. times, I was patient, but there was a lot of times <laughs> I'm like, dude, dude. <laughs> well, okay, in my defense, I did tell you, yes, I do want to get into camera, but... I don't know anything. And you said, it's fine. It's easy. No, yeah. And it wasn't, no, Jerry. But, I, but I, you know, it, it ended, you know, after enough, uh, you know. Because there was times, like, at the, towards, the, like, the last, like, times that we worked together, you were, like, <laughs> I, like, I did everything for you. Kinda. Yeah, I know. I was shocked. <laughs> so, but, you know, he learns. He's a, you know, slow learner, you know. But he she learns. You could attest to that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. But, it, but then, but now I can't even... Get, hey, Sam, you, nah, man, I don't want to do that. You know, nah, 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 <laughs> That's nah, not true. Man, That's not true. <laughs> hey, Sam, hey, man, I got to shoot. Uh, how much? Nah, I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's all Hollywood on me now. <laughs> One thing I, do you, do you have a reel? Yeah. You have a reel where you have, like, shots cut up and then you right. have music on it. And uh, it's like, choo, 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 you know, that yeah. kind of. Everyone's got one of those, I right? don't have one. You I've don't? never had a reel. Oh, really? No. I just don't, because of what I do, I'd rather have the whole pieces or get a chunk of the piece. Interesting. So okay. if you look on my website, there's no reel. I don't have a reel. It's, it's pieces of the things that I've worked on. And I work on a lot of short, that's the beauty of these documentaries, is you can make these three-minute documentaries, but it's basically your reel. And you're right. telling a story from beginning to middle to end. And it showcases how, if you can tell a story, but I have never had a reel. That's good. I mean, I've never really liked reels because if you're making like a directing reel, especially yeah. it's like it's really hard to showcase directing inside yeah. of a reel where it's mostly music yeah. dominant. Yeah. It's, it's more like I feel like cinematographers, sometimes you could make it cool, but yeah. like a, a reel out of it. But, you know, you kind of adjust your style a lot yeah. depending on what you're shooting. Right. So yeah. if you make a reel with one piece of music, then. You know, you have like yeah. you have to kind of crush everything into it. If I'm speaking with a director who I've never worked with the first time, and I show them a finished film that I worked on that was ten minutes or seven minutes, you know, I have so my work's so diverse that if it's a music thing, I got you. If it's 
uh, some comedy thing, I got you. If it's this, I, you know, and I show them that, and then they can get a sensibility if I can tell a story. It's one thing to get a really cool, pretty shot. Yeah. But it's a whole nother thing to be able to get the shots required to create into a story. In a like sequence, you yeah. You have to yeah. stitch everything together yeah. instead of just going, oh, because anyone, especially now with the technology, yeah. Anybody could just take an iPhone and just like, yeah. but there's still a lot of trash content yeah. out yeah. there, you know, so. Yeah. But I mean, I think that, you know, the the cream rises to the top, right? Right. And even though there's all this content, everybody's shooting all this stuff, you, people know what the good stuff is. Yeah. They do. And so that stuff just kind of passes all that nonsense down there. Uh -huh. Can we put your Instagram right here? Or you no? can. You can. Okay. Right you there. Imagine, but then you, but you'll you never But I got to update it. it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we put it, the website, website, sure. And that's where... Okay, we'll put the website yeah. right over it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right over it. Boom, right yeah. there. Bam. And that's where you can find the most current stuff that I'm working on. Okay, cool. Yeah. cool. I update that, you know, as much as I can. I mean, I, that's the other thing, too, is now with all these, you know, different platforms, I get those cease and desist a lot, too. You can't put this up. You take it down or we'll sue you. Right. Yeah. No, that's kind of the tricky part, yeah. especially like even like, you know, actors who are in movies and yeah. stuff, they put together, you know, their acting reels. Yeah. Right. But when they take those clips that they're acting in, yeah. they, people go, you can't use that yeah. shot because that's yeah. that's <laughs> universal property. I know it's 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 just gotten kind of ridiculous. So I've got like 20 bucks if you want to just kind of like maybe tell us all who Banksy is. Oh, oh I can tell you who Banksy is. You gotta, you gotta say no. the words first. Sam. Give us an email. Just, <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs>